This podcast is sponsored by Nobody. Hey babies, this is Lar Park Lincoln, Tina from Friday the 13th Part 7, The New Blood, and you're listening to Tommy Throwback Kovac on Splat from the Past. Hey Bad News Crews, Tommy has a joke for you. Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror and sci-fi show where things could get totally radical. Now today, I will be welcoming Ethan Wiley. Ethan, of course, wrote the first two House movies, and he directed House 2. He also uh, directed Children of the Corn 5, Fields of Terror, and uh, he also began as a Creature Crew member on Return of the Jedi, the Star Wars sequel, and Gremlins. And it's going to be a great conversation today, I can't wait to find out um, what working on those films were like. And it's going to be a spectacular conversation, I think. October, Halloween October is just becoming more and more phenomenal, like it does every year. But this year has been pretty interesting with the eclectic guests that I am getting. So, uh, yeah, here is my interview with Ethan Wiley. Welcome to the show, sir. How are you today? I'm good. Right. This is uh, such a great honor. Thank you for taking the time today. No problem. So, going back in time, what age did you start gravitating towards uh, movies? Um, that's a good question. Well, you know, as a kid, we'd watch the creature features on the weekends. Right. We'd staying up late to watch you know, everything from Plan 9, <laughs> from Outer Space, to, uh, you know, The War of the Worlds, Incredible Shrink, and, uh, you know, all those old classics, The Thing, the original, The Thing. Right. And uh, and so, from a young age, I liked fiction, and H.G. Wells was my favorite, you know, novelist, because I, you know, got to be a little older, 11, 12, whatever, reading. Ray Bradbury, um, right. H.G. Wells, those are probably my, my favorites. And um, and I like comedy, too. I, you know, I was way deep into the co- com- comedy. Um, I like the old comedians like uh, Red Skelton and Phil Silver. And, uh, and then, uh, you know, those were early influences, too. And then, yeah, just, uh, you know, all in the family. Uh, some of the sitcom comedy uh, yeah. or whatever. So, those are my favorite thing. Yeah, it kind of. And then, um, and then I started doing theater uh, in junior high, and, uh, and it was was a really good mimic, uh, and could do lots of silly voices and things. Got that from my father, who was a great mimic, and could do lots of silly voices and things, um, and so the performance, I guess you'd say, you know, yeah. the acting, things like that. So those early influences, I guess, uh, <laughs> showed up in my work not too much longer after that. <laughs> yeah. Did you want to be an actor at a certain point? Yeah, you know, that's how I kind of started off, uh, you know, acting, and and I just, uh, I, I got the leads in a bunch of plays when I was, you know, in high school and stuff. Um um, and, uh, and so but from an early age too, I mean, I guess, and even in high school, I was started writing my own material and, uh, and, and would sacrilegiously, you know, improvise off of scenes and, uh, you know, written by famous people <laughs> and, uh, and kind of fashion them into my own kind of concepts and things. And then, uh, uh, and then in, uh, and then started messing around with uh, film because my mother actually was uh, a filmmaker. Mm-hmm. Um, she, she did kind of experimental avant-garde filmmaking. Uh, my father is a modern artist, and so I kind of grew up in a very you know creative atmosphere. And mom had this Super 8 
film equipment around. So started making movies, although it was expensive, right? Mm-hmm. Back then, you know, getting buying a roll of film, developing it was not cheap, you know. So you had to these little three minute Super Eight reels that you would treat very carefully and very sparingly. We didn't have video where we could just run for hours and spin it. Um, yeah. So, uh, and then I had a comedy review in high school as well with a couple of buddies, uh, including Jim Isaac, um, who was a childhood friend from when we were eight years old, mm-hmm. who later went on to direct uh, Jason X and uh, House 3, uh, as it's known in some circles. Um, yeah. The, the horror show, right? Right. Um, and then he, we worked together, we can get into that, but uh, yeah, so, so Jimmy and I had a comedy review and we would co-direct plays and in college when I was at UCLA, I would come back to Marin County and he would direct my original plays uh, here with actors and things. And, and uh, so theater and acting, you know, was always a part of my, my life, even into the early early 80s and then filmmaking kind of became all consuming and uh i really haven't done theater now for many years yeah were, th- were there any uh, specific filmmakers that uh it influenced you um well i was a big fan of uh cooper um hmm. hal ashby um and uh who else um and then some of the Different genre filmmakers, uh, you know, John Carpenter's The Thing, the origi- or his version of The Thing. I remember going there and watching in the movie theaters with my my boss Chris Whalas. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, we did the movie Gremlins, and and we walked out of the theater both loving the movie, just thinking it was phenomenal, fantastic. And Chris was good friends with Rob Bottin, who did all the special effects for that movie. Right. But I I thought it was a great film on every level, not just the effects, but I thought the drama and the kind of, uh, you know, the, the, the paranoia themes and everything, I thought it was really, really well done. And then we were in total shock when it got such a horrible <laughs> reception. I mean, I don't think there's one critic in the world who liked that film when it first came out. It just seemed like it was just savaged. Everybody hated it, and we were just mystified. And it's nice to see that things turned around for that movie, you know? Yeah. Um, and now recognize it as the great classic film that it is. Um, but, you know, it was an early lesson about <laughs> you know, uh, critical reception of your work and... and uh, yeah, you never know, you know. Right. So you attended uh, UCLA and you studied uh, theater and film. Uh, did any of your classmates go on to become uh, successful in the business? Well, I think you know a couple of them, from what I understand, um, or you've interviewed them, uh, including uh, my good friend Lance Guest. Yep. Um, and uh, Shane Black, Fred Decker, Tim Robbins. Um, who else? Oh, so many. Ed Solomon. Cam- Cameron um, Dye. Cameron Dye. Uh, yeah, a lot of actors. Um, and then, you know, people like Fred Decker, you know, he was in the English department because he had been rejected by the film department bitterly, <laughs> you know. And <laughs> yeah. so he was kind of uh, the best thing he could find was uh, being an English major. But he drifted over to hanging out with us in the theater department. And... Um, and we were roommates, uh, kind of by total coincidence, um, which, you know, we had we didn't know each other, but we had mutual connection. And I said, hey, a bunch of us are getting a house, you know, to rent, and and we need, you know, two people have to share a room, you know. And we were like, okay, I'll share rooms. So I was doing anything I could to yeah. be cheap and save money. And and, uh, and so we met one day, and it was kind of like, oh, so, you know, what are you into? And well, I want to be a filmmaker. Oh, me too. Um, where are you from? Mar- Marin County. Oh, me too. And we realized we'd gone to the two high schools that are, you know, a mile apart, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, and so it was just kind of a bizarre coincidence. And so, um, and at that point, Fred was, you know, knew a lot more about filmmaking than I did. I was still kind of the theater dude, do, you know, and performing, and doing yeah. theater, and which was great because I got so much experience with working with actors and directing your writing which you could then put up on a stage and it didn't cost a lot of money like a film would um 
And part of the reason I was so cheap is I was like, okay, I'm going to save up money so that I can make a film at some point, you know. Right. Um, and uh, so anyway, you know, Fred would point out to me like how they were covering a, a scene in a film. He'd say, see, that's the master. And this is, see, the over shoulder this way and the over shoulder that. I was like, oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> my my student films before that were just like, you know, it was okay, here's the camera, everybody perform in front of it, you know. Right. So then I, I went home for a summer and now could create all these amazing new techniques I'd learned about, you know, POVs and handheld and dolly shots and, you know, reverse shots and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then I got into the film department, which was just a two-year program, so I applied. But I didn't tell anybody in the theater department, and so I got into it a... Uh, an intensive year-long directing program in the theater school, which was great, uh, but it was supposedly reserved for just theater students, and and so I was nervous they would catch me at some point. And so after the year had ended, the three quarters had ended, I I confessed to the professor, uh, Professor McLean. Mm -hmm. I said, you know, I have something to confess to you. I'm actually in the film department, and he he kind of chuckled and said, yeah, I know. And I realized he had known the whole time that I, you know, wasn't in the right place. But he, I guess, liked me enough that uh, he let me, you know, stay in the class and get credit for it. Yeah. Um, so that was really kind of my, my my directing, you know, education was there and a little bit in film school. You know. Right. Well, how, the, how does um, become a, a, a creature technician for Return of the Jedi come into play? Well, uh, I didn't have any connections in the film business at all. Uh, no family, no relatives, no nothing. And, uh, and so at one point I was lamenting this to my father, who had been an art teacher at the University of Davis for, you know, a few mm -hmm. years. And he just casually says, oh, you know, there's a student of mine um, who uh, works for that. God, what that guy who makes the Star Wars films or something like that? I like, mean, he works for George Lucas. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's the guy. Yeah, and he works. I don't know. He builds like spaceships or something for. Him. I was like, Dad, do you have his number? Oh yeah, he'd be happy to talk to you. <laughs> you <know? laughs> so I got his number, and it's a guy named Mark Thorpe. And Mark Thorpe was in the model uh, department at Industrial Light and Magic. He later went on to create Robot Wars. You know, battle bots, the, the concept of robots fighting in the ring. Um, and it was a real interesting guy, and he adored my father. He was like his favorite teacher, favorite artist. So he was thrilled that he helped the son of, of <laughs> uh, William <laughs> Wiley. And, uh, and so he got me a job literally sweeping the floors at ILM. And I mean literally sweeping the floors. My first day in the creature shop was, here's a broom clean up all this crap that was all over the floor, all the foam and latex and everything. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I did that for a couple of weeks. And then uh, they were like, Quick, we need somebody to make Ewok feet. And I was like, okay, you know, so mm -hmm. here's the molds, here's the glue, here's the fur, this is how you cut it, you know. So my first real job in the, in the film business was making Ewok feet yeah. <laughs> for Return of the Jedi. <laughs> and then a few weeks after that, they said, we need you to drive up to the set in, you know, Eureka in, in Northern California to deliver all the Ewok feet to the Ewoks. <laughs> I said, okay. So I drove up there and, um, and there was another young guy, Kirk Thatcher, who mm -hmm. later went on to direct for the Muppets, uh, and Jim Henson. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so, uh, then they crowded me into staying and helping, you know, dress and prep the Ewoks for uh, all the action scenes. Because yeah. at this point, it was just the second unit. I, it wasn't the first unit, so none of the major actors around. I didn't get to meet any of them. But uh, it was all stunts, action, explosions, all the cool stuff, really, you know. And, uh, mm -hmm. and so there I was, age 21, 20, uh, you know, on a film set, a huge film set, you know, for the first time, blowing up a bunker, uh, you know, the, the um, roots through the forest, you know, the, the motorcycle, the levitating motorcycle, all that stuff. I got to yeah. see how they were doing all of it. Um, so that was great. And so Kirk Thatcher and I were Ewok Wranglers and, uh, and a couple other people were there too. 
but uh, and then Kirk and I worked together on on Gremlin uh, as well, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, remain friends to this day. Wow. So then that uh, led to Gremlins. Yeah, and then so after Return of the Je Jedi ended, and everybody was kind of burned out. Um, Chris had left uh, earlier, basically, to, yeah, and he decided to start his own company. Mm -hmm. And he was literally working out of his garage in Novato, California. And I had two opportunities. One was to become an apprentice editor for uh, Francis Ford Coppola, right. which sounded like amazing. And I didn't know a whole lot about editing. I'd taken editing courses and all that, but I thought, what a great way to learn that side of things. And then the other was Chris Whalers was looking for an assistant, you know, just to kind of start his company and uh, and so I met with Chris and was just so impressed with him as an individual and he and I just clicked mm -hmm. humor you know I could see he knew so much about film making beyond just creature making he, he, he you know was a volume of I mean an encyclopedia of, of information about films and genre films and things mm -hmm. um, and so I gambled. I thought, you know, even though the other job is like a union paying job, pays better, you know, and there's you're working on this big couple of movie called One from the Heart, yeah. uh, which of course later was a disaster. But um, <laughs> I just, I got a gut feeling that I, I could learn a lot from Chris and, and that I just believed in his uh, talent. And so then we spent almost a year unemployed and he was paying me out of his own pocket to do prototypes and, and things like we'd get a call for a potential job. Uh, one was Starman, you know, doing tests and designs to create a translucent kind of alien creature for, for Starman. And, uh, and then that fell through and then months was going by. And finally he was like, you know, I, I can't afford to pay anymore. And I'm thinking I left UCLA to do this, <laughs> you know, like be unemployed. And, uh, and again, loved what I was learning from Chris and, and loved working with him and all that. But we were spending, you know, more afternoons like watching old movies and him commenting on what, how they, these things were done than they were working. Dante called out of the blue. Or Mike Finnell, his producer, super low budget film that Spielberg wants to produce. He like wants to do a horror movie. And uh, can you quickly, you know, get some tests done and do some mock-ups of these creatures, these gremlins. And uh, I worked on the film for over two years after that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it was uh, amazing luck, amazing timing. And, uh, and got to work on one of the great <laughs> horror films of time and, and was involved in the whole making of it from beginning to end. Yeah, I, I reached out to Chris Wayless a couple of years ago, and he told me that he was hard of hearing now. Otherwise, he w he would uh, do an interview. I thought that was that was very heartwarming and sad at the same time. You know. Yeah, Chris has had some challenges with the hearing thing, um, and uh, I, I haven't spoken to him recently. But you know, he was getting the the, the cochlear implants uh, mm -hmm. and things, and and doing better. But uh, yeah, that's been a been a tough, frustrating road for him. Um, but, uh, but we worked together, you know, uh, on my, my most recent film, which we co-wrote the script and he designed the creature for a, a, a movie I shot in China called Journey to the Forbidden Valley, mm -hmm. um, which is, which is China's legend of Bigfoot. Nice. Um, it, they're kind of, uh, their creature. Yeah. And, uh, and so we had a, a wild, difficult film to make in China. But uh, yeah, so so I started off with my first film with with Chris and uh, well second second film. I mean, actually, Chris designed a lot of the creatures in Return of the Jedi too. But uh, um, yeah, and my most recent film was with Chris. So it was nice to have a reunion, work together. Yeah. So what's the uh, genesis of House? Well, House. Um, uh, you know, Fred Decker and I were roommates. We were uh, writing things together, theater, um, and and you know uh, things like that, uh, mm -hmm. and directing uh, each other's work, um, acting in each other's plays, um, and doing a lot of collaborations. And and but but uh, Fred, you know, he had good professional TV scripts and things all done, and I was writing avant-garde theater, so. 
he got an agent and uh, and got a job uh, with Steve Miner, the director of House, uh, mm-hmm. doing a, a remake of Godzilla in 3D. And and so we had earlier talked about making a low budget film at at his house in in uh, San Rafael, which is an old Victorian. <coughs> Excuse me. Mm-hmm. And so we were like, yeah, I, I've got the creature knowledge, you know, and the, the buddies and stuff that I can whip together the low budgets cheap and effectively and we can use your house and see yeah, i've got this idea for a haunted house film and uh, as i recall it was a, a several page long treatment and uh, and so we were like yeah we got to do this and so then he got the job doing godzilla and i was now back from um working on gremlins i decided to go back was to try to make you know my attempt at becoming a writer and dream of being a film director mm-hmm. and, and so I was I wrote a script wasn't that thrilled with it um, and uh, you know first time writing a feature length script you learn a lot you know and yeah. so I said okay that's 105 pages I'll away in a drawer now I understand kind of the form I didn't ever anything long like that before and he had the house treatment and we were like well you're working on Godzilla why don't I take you know the treatment, and I'll do a run after the script, or first draft, and then you know, if together we can, you know, that go. You can direct it, and we'll up to and Bren, and you know, I'll do the special effects, and you direct, and, mm-hmm. and all that. So I wrote the script, <coughs> and I was very happy with it. I, I thought it was a lot of fun, and uh, and so I gave it to Fred and, and said, hey, maybe you can give this to Steve or. Sean Cunningham or something just to see you know they're like the horror guys like see if um, they you know do onto an agent you know and uh, and so Steve Miner read it loved it and little did I know that Godzilla was was falling on hard times and looked like it was not going to be going quickly and so he said hey I want this mm-hmm. and I was like well Okay, uh, and that oh, that happened. At that point, I didn't have an agent. Mm-hmm. Um, Ed Solomon, uh, who also had an agent, he, you know, he he looked, he gave it to his agents. Said, Guys, got to check this out, and they trash. And and so then uh, suddenly the phone was ringing off the hook with every agency in town. Once they learned there was a greenlit movie, you know, in mm-hmm. production, and the writer didn't have an agent. Um, and so, you know, when people sometimes ask me, how do you get an agent? I say, well, it's, it helps to have a green film. <laughs> 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 that, was, that, was the, you know, that was the only way it was possible. Other than that, yeah. never would have gotten the door. It would have gotten anywhere. But yeah, having a movie in production, that, that helps. Yeah. So, yeah, a bunch of lucky, you know, timing and coincidence and, and maybe a, a good, good, good enough script that, uh, you know, it got made and. The rest is history, as they say. Yeah. When the movie um, came out, you know, people were comparing the tone of the comedy and the scares to uh, Ghostbusters. Was that movie um, an influence at all? Um, yes. Um, I liked aspects of Ghosters, Ghostbusters, but there's also parts that I didn't like. Um, I love the absurd stuff, you know, the big marshmallow man at the end and all that. Right. Um, and, uh, uh, and so, um, I don't know. It's hard to say. I mean, I, I, yeah, I mean, I loved all those act, uh, you know, Dan Aykroyd and all that. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess, um, to me, the kind of concept of house was, was a little bit like, what if you were, you know, what if this happened to you and, and you would, you know, want to get it, you'd want to get it on film, you know? So I, yeah. I wanted people to, to react realistically, actually, and not like in typical or cliche responses to things, and and so and I, and I found that also that if you react realistically to supernatural events, it's it's kind of hilarious, you know, because, yeah. it's, because it's, it's so absurd. So you know, one of my favorite scenes in House is when he's got like eight video cameras and the neighbor, like he wants the neighbor to be there to see, like that he's not crazy. Right. Um, 
And I kind of that's how I would be if I suddenly was witnessing phenomena. Look, you come over here. Are you seeing this too? You know, um, and uh, and so other things like um, the fat witch, as I call it. You know, in house. You know, we've seen skinny, scrawny, skeletal witches and things, but I, you know, this was kind of his subconscious coming to life. So I did what's the the nightmare of the of the ex-wife who in reality is this beautiful attractive woman uh you know comes back as this obese you know horrid or ogre you know yeah and so it was also trying to flip the the kind of the cliche expectations you've got for things on their head a little bit uh and and from that to me i think you know the comedy kind of comes out situations and circumstances um i i hope you know yeah and uh and so I wasn't afraid to laugh in a horror film. And to me, like, I always point out to people that there's big laughs in The Exorcism. Yeah. People forget that. But there's a couple of, like, laugh out loud moments uh, and, uh, and satirical characters, um, you know, in, in the film. Um, Roman Polanski and his dark humor, yeah. um, you know, his, his uh, you know, thrillers and things. And so for me, that just kind of naturally comes out of the material of your, you know, not, and, and so to me, to kind of pretend that these crazy things aren't a little crazy and, and be able to have a, a black humor about them or a dark sense of comedy, it comes naturally with, with the genre as I, as I view it, as I see it. Yeah. I, I, the movie has always, uh, for me, always been like a commentary on PTSD in combat in, in Vietnam. Did you guys uh, see it that way? Yes. Yeah. And not having been to Vietnam, um, you know, writing those scenes, uh, I, I searched and searched for, for subject material or, I guess, you know, something that would kind of... Uh, reflect what, what it's like for a, a person to be in the middle of one of those battles because all these books are always like well then this the Tet Offensive happened on this date and it's mm -hmm. all about the military strategy and I finally found this book called Blood Brothers that was African American soldiers first hand experiences like told from their point of view like interviews that were edited into a book mm -hmm. and that was great because it really explained like from a first person perspective what it was like to be there now i don't make any great claims about the film but when um uh what was his name eric brody um the special effects supervisor had been a vietnam vet mm -hmm. and he came up to me early in the production he said i want to tell you that these vietnam scenes he said they are they ring true did your father like how do you how did you write this you know mm -hmm. and i kind of told him i said well i just kind of used a bunch of sources and he said he says i got the chills he said i started shaking when i read these scenes he said that they just like yeah this is what it was like um so i took that as a, a badge of honor that he'd kind of given his approval up uh, you know thumbs up of, of those scenes and i thought okay then i'm not you know as a writer you want to reflect something that's somewhat authentic. Now, we're talking about a cheesy or a comedy, so not get too heavy about it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, 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 was, I was glad that he didn't say, this is BS. <laughs> you know? um, and, uh, and so I remember re later reading some kind of critic that said, hey, this is one of the first genre film the horror of Vietnam. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. I, I had no idea. Um, so, uh, yeah, that, that came from Fred's original story, mm -hmm. you know, uh, about the guy being haunted by his experiences in war. And uh, so, yeah, underpinning the comedy, you know, horror is, is, is a sense confronting early. Um, and so, for me, the concept is that the haunted house preys upon whoever is in it preys upon their their psychology you know their yeah. their demons their longings their fears their their problems. Um, and that was kind of the concept did you spend a, lo a lot of time on the uh, the set of the first one because I know usually they don't like the writers coming to the set 
you know, Steve Miner was phenomenal that way. I had total carte blanche. I was on the set as much as I wanted to be. It was kind of instrumental in putting together the effects team uh, and several of the people I'd worked with, you know, on uh, on Gremlins uh, were on that on that uh, crew and uh, and some others that went on to, you know, have great careers. And uh, so I was, you know, kind of the special effects advisor, uh, uncredited. Um, but uh, so I was kind of important, I think, in, in putting it all that help, helping put all that together uh, on a super low budget, too. I mean, you have to remember that this was, you know, an extremely low budget film for the time. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and we were scraping it together, you know. Um, and uh, and then Steve was just very comfortable and, and I have to say, I think I was smart in being very sensitive about him letting me on the set. So if I saw a line reading that I didn't think was right, I would just, like, when I saw he had a moment, I'd go up and whisper in his ear, never say anything out loud or, you know, to, or to contradict him. You know, so I was super respectful that he was the, the general in charge and he would make final decisions and everything. But he my my comments, and especially with my stand-up comedy at that point in comedy I, I, I felt like I had a good handle on you know how to make some of these moments funny and, and he often would go oh yeah that's great good idea you know and yeah. then I'd go see him make an adjustment with the actor and then suddenly the line was really funny you know and again a director you've got so many things going on especially with effects and things that it's easy to lose track of a subtle little reading so I think he liked having me there just to kind of you know whisper in his ear occasionally about something and uh but you know what you know what how lucky am i to have an experience like that and have him be so so open and and confident you know confident enough to let me uh, weigh in and and you know uh and joe dante was like that too by the way you know Mm -hmm. uh we had a favorite thing about joe where he would say uh thank you no (laughs) and we did a t-shirt actually that said that um but the great thing about Joe is you could go up and say, hey, what if we had the gremlin do this and that? And he'd go, uh, thank you, no. And just, I, you know, I'm busy. I, I'm not being dismissive of you, but I, I'm quickly rejecting the idea because i got to get on to something else. But he is quickly he would say yes. Go, oh, great idea. Yeah, let's do that. Let's skateboard. Yeah, let's work outside one ride a skateboard. Great. And and so uh, that, was, that was another, you know, great, great thing, seeing a director who, isn't insecure, you know, who has confidence in themselves. And so they're not going to be afraid of, you know, the best idea in the room. They get credit for it. You know, they're going to take the credit of the blame. So that's how I've always directed is like, hey, you know, I'm going to get the credit or I'm going to get the blame. So uh, if you have a better idea, let's put it in there, you know. Right. And um, with House 2, you directed, but you wrote the script in two weeks, right? Yeah, and I think the film suffered for that. I it was like I was everything in the kitchen sink, you know, to, to come up with uh, uh, quickly, and um, and so. But again, I, I you know, um, I was given a lot of freedom too, you know, to create the movie um, with budget limitations and and certain production things. Like there was a couple of crucial scenes that didn't get filmed because uh, the budget or you know the schedule didn't have time for it and and the producer just said we're cutting those scenes and i was like but they're crucial that doesn't matter you know well we'll we'll edit together later and we'll see and then and then we'll do pickups if necessary and so no pickups i mean not one pickup shot you know <laughs> uh, and uh that's not usual for movies the, these days you know you usually get a chance to go back and fix some things and change some things but no it was like okay here's what you shot edit it we're putting the movie out um so um, I think House 2 has a lot of great moments in it and a lot of great ideas in it. And as an overall film, um, it was, you know, it's not one I like to go back and watch a lot. But I know it has its its followers and supporters and a lot of people who like it better than the first one. Um, I think it's gentler, sweeter, not as, I think, horror fans don't like it much because it's not that scary. Um, it's kind of more of a children's horror film. I think it works really well for, you know, kids up, up to 13 14 years old because uh i don't know there's a lot of imagination in it a lot of fun things a lot of comedy you know uh, yeah 
I saw the second one first, you know, I, but I prefer the, the original um, of the two. But um, I, I do like the great people that are associated with the second one that I've talked to, like Ari and Lar and Jonathan. And um, I, I, I do like, there's a lot of elements I do like about it. But I, I was curious to know, though, like, was there any consideration of bringing back the original cast before they all got cast? Uh, yeah, um, but uh, it was nixed because of uh, budgetary concerns. Um, I think the producer just thought that, you know, these actors are going to ask for a lot more money the second time around. And so me being eager, I was like, well, I can come up with a whole new movie. <laughs> okay, <laughs> let's do that instead. Um, so that was kind of a financial decision. Um, because, yeah, it would have made sense to have Roger and Harold and their continuing adventures. I mean, how much fun would that have been? But um, it was like, oh, I, I can't afford to pay these actors. You know? Yeah. <laughs> so let's get a bunch of unknowns, you know. Uh, I mean, not total unknowns. They were all, you know, accomplished actors at that point in time. Uh, but they weren't coming back for the second of a, of a hit sequel. I mean, House opened number one in the nation. It's opening weekend, you know. Yeah. Um, which is pretty amazing for a low-budget horror film. Um, and, uh, but I got a quick lesson in uh, dose and humility when I, I sold a script to Warner brothers, you know, bidding war back in the eighties when all that was going on, mm -hmm. a lot of money. And so I went to meet with one of the vice presidents at Warner brothers, you know, to discuss the development of the project and the script and everything. It was a fiction film. And, uh, and, and so the executive, uh, said, uh, so, like, what's going on with you? You know, and I said, well, said, you know, House came out this weekend, and and she said, what's that? And I was like, uh, it's the number one film in the, the nation right now. Mm -hmm. She said, oh, good for you. Uh huh. And she'd never heard of it, didn't care about it, because it was just like a little bunch more film, you know. <laughs> and I was like, God, it's hard to impress these people. I have the number one film in the country, and she's not even heard of it, and doesn't care. You know. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh my God, this is a tough town. You know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just like, yeah, Warner Brothers does not care if New Line had a little TV horror film come out and make a few bucks on a weekend. Oh, <laughs> Couldn't care less. Oh, now they work together. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, New World, not New Line. I'm sorry. Mixed yeah. them up. New World. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Roger Corman's, you know, low budget. You know, I mean, it just wasn't, wasn't even on her radar screen, you know, no, she's, she's dealing with Spielberg and Clint Eastwood. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, she doesn't care about them. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that didn't do much for my career there, you know? Um, but, uh, how did you, um, how did you find Bill Maher? You know, he was just kind of on the circuit of comedy actors trying to get gigs and stuff. And, uh, and so I remember, uh, Bill, you know, uh, going down to a comedy club. Was he performing? I guess he was performing. Mm -hmm. uh, and he was there with his girlfriend at, at the time, beautiful woman. And, uh, and we had drinks and hung out, and we just got along. Uh, we had similar kind of sense of humor and political bent and things. And I just found his uh, droll sense of humor uh, really damn funny. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so uh, I remember, you know, uh, I got along great with Bill. Um, he, uh, I guess, was tough on my crew. I remember costume girls is coming to crying and my Bill is hard. And I was like, what? I have no problems with Bill. He's he's fine. <laughs> um, but um, I remember one of the funny things was, um, and this is one of the things I loved about him. We, we were doing uh, sound re-recording, you know, dubbing, uh, and we were at the Lions Gate editing facility before Lionsgate was a studio over on Bundy, I guess, in, in West LA. And, and, uh, there was this parking lot in the back and it was like really tight. Like you, you park car behind car behind car and squeeze them in and everyone would be always coming to the, is, do you have the, the, the gray Honda Accord? Yeah, that's me. You know, can you move it? Um, and so I was, he was a little late and I sort of went out to the back because I told him where to park and, here he comes pulling up in this brand new Mercedes convertible. You know, he's finally like, he's got a movie role. He's comedy starting to hit. He's making some money. He's got this beautiful new Mercedes convertible. 
and he comes in, but he's got to squeeze in the parking lot against the cement wall, and he just scrapes the whole side of the car on the <laughs> <laughs> as he pulls in. I'm like, oh no! I'm thinking this guy is going to be absolutely out of his gourd, and and then trying to get him to calm down to to do the recording is going to be impossible, you know. Mm-hmm. And he gets out, looks at it, and goes. I'm such an idiot. <laughs> He's like, my brand new car, first day I scraped the whole side of it. And he was just making fun of himself and laughing at it and and just shrugged it off and, you know, came in and did his thing. And I thought, this guy's this guy's too much. I would have been in tears if that had been me. He just <laughs> laughed it off like, yeah, I'm a, like, look what a jerk I am with my fancy car trying to be a big, big, big shot. And look, the first thing I do is scrape it all up. <laughs> And uh, yeah, and Ari. Oh my God, I've talked. You know, I've talked to him twice. He's such a deep thinker of, of a guy, and he's so great in the movie. He was coming off a of Soul Man at the time. That's right. That, that that was the Steve Miner connection. Steve had recommended him for the role, uh, and I guess I saw Soul Man before we cast. Yeah, and uh, yeah, you know, House had been the biggest hit for for New World until Soul Man. You know, and, and so Steve Miner was on quite a streak there, um, and uh, so yeah, that's how how he came into the cast, and yeah, wonderful actor and and uh, great, uh, you know, and and a, a real, uh, you know, a guy who does theater and uh, takes his craft, you know, very seriously, and and uh, uh, you know, yeah, yeah, excellent, I- excellent actor, and Jonathan Stark too, you know, was just great. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, brilliant improvisational comedian. Uh, I was sad when he, you know, moved into into writing and right. directing TV uh, and and kind of backed away from his performance career because uh, he had a great, you know, uh, s- unique style and energy about him and and one of the fastest best improvisers I've ever seen do improv comedy. Yeah, yeah. Did Lar did Lar just come in for the audition or did you see her in something? You know, yeah, I think Laura came into audition, and um, uh, and same with Amy uh, Yazbek. Uh, Amy was a total unknown at that point. Yeah, uh, you know, Laura had some had some TV shows, and she had some you know some some credits. Amy had next to none, as I recall. And I just remember thinking, like, how's a woman this beautiful, this funny? I mean, she just had it all. I and and, uh, and I thought, God, she's just. Uh, incredible uh natural funny talent you know mm-hmm. almost like you almost say like does she know how funny she is she's so good with her timing and things so um i was not surprised to see you know her her later success um and uh and so yeah yeah was a, and then and then of course uh uh we've got to talk about the electrician <laughs> <laughs> how was um, it? and uh mm-hmm. Oh, go ahead. John Ratzenberger. Yeah, John Ratzenberger. How he came to the cast, same thing. He came in an audition. Of course, I knew who he was from Cheers. Mm-hmm. And and so, but one of the things is thinking, okay, here's the schlubby postal guy. And he's got that just great sense of blue-collar workers and kind of how they think and talk and act. It just he, he's got a really great connection to that. Yeah. And uh, so his, his line readings and stuff, you know, it was just like, oh, he was born for this part. Right? It's just like too good to be true. Um, and uh, and then we had the like, isn't this hilarious that we had George went from Cheers to the first one. Yeah. Now we got the, another Cheers guy. Like, again, coincidence, but we thought that's pretty funny. I used to joke that we're going to have real, real Perlman be in House 3, you know. Yeah. Um, but, but, uh, so, but then it came to the action stuff because he had to have this big fight scene, and so I was like, "So, are you, John? Are you comfortable doing like fight scenes?" And he goes, "Oh well, you know, I went to the Royal Academy, you know, uh, in uh, in England, and we studied stage combat and and fencing, sword fighting, I, yeah, judo. I've done all that stuff." And I was like, "What? <laughs> okay, you know." So he gets on the set, and you know he doesn't need no stunt double. He's doing all the kicks and all the stuff himself. He's he's awesome. Yeah, it's like amazing. Yeah, yeah. You know, he was born for the part. How about how about Kane Hodder? Oh, Kane. God, you know Kane has almost worked on every movie I've done. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, he was, you know, stunt coordinator, obviously, on the first one and came from doing the uh, the Jason stuff. And uh, and so I gave him a you know, little cameo there in House 2 mm-hmm. where he does the flip off the balcony in the gorilla suit. And um, and then uh, later when I did uh, Children of the Corn 5 for um, from uh, Miramax, uh, I hired him to be my stunt supervisor and gave him a cameo there in the, in the saloon scene. He mm-hmm. plays the bartender in a scene. Um, so yeah, worked with Kane in a bunch of different films. Yeah, great guy. Yeah, um, funny guy too. You know, I've I've met him a couple times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A horror legend, of course. But uh, yeah, we had some good times together. So so after House Two, why why was it um, a decade before you directed again with Children of the Corn Five? Um, well, uh, welcome to Hollywood. You know, um, <laughs> House Two. You know, just being a kind of tweener, not really a horror film, not really a comedy, kind of didn't give anybody confidence that I could do either. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, and so it took a long time. And, but during that time, I was selling scripts, writing scripts, making a good living as a screenwriter. Um, so I was financially, you know, comfortable enough. Um, and uh, and so when I I got a new agent. I went through a couple of different agents. It was kind of, you know, submitting, and then I was starting to submit scripts, and not getting good response to them, and kind of frustrated with, uh, you know, not being able to, you know, the, the the days of selling spec scripts are kind of over, you know. Yeah. So I was like, okay, I got to go get a job, and and I did. I did so a lot of things for hire during that time as well, working for different studios and things. Um, and so my my agent uh, called me one day and said, "Hey, I've got a you know an interview for you. you I got a pitch. You, know, you can go in and pitch, Children of the Corn Five. And I was like, "That sounds like a career killer. <laughs> like, what you, the, the fifth in the you know I I remember I saw one years ago, but I didn't even know there was a two through four. Yep, they need one for five. And I was like, Yeah, I don't know. And she said, You know." If you ever want to direct again, you better go in and try to, you know, it's been nine years since you've directed, you know, like, uh, okay, okay, you're right. I'll, I'll work up a story. And, and actually, I kind of was, you know, read the original script and looked at some of the movies. And I've always had a kind of fascination with cults. Mm-hmm. And it actually had a file on cults, um, wanting to do some kind of cult movie at some point. And so here's my opportunity to do a cult movie. And, um, and you know, kind of build in some things I'd learned about cults into the concept and the storyline, and uh, so I went to um, pitch to uh, Bob Weinstein, and and so I they fly me into L.A. This is a little bit of a long story, but it's a good one. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so. They fly me into L.A. because I lived in New York at the time, and I was like, "Hey, Miramax is right down in the you know in the city. I, I can hop on a train and meet him anytime." And they're like, uh, "Okay, great." Then I get a call. Look, he doesn't have time to meet with you in New York, but he needs to meet with you right away. Yeah. So he's in L.A. Can we fly you to L.A. Put you up at a hotel? We'll give you a per diem, rent a car, the whole thing, and you'll just be there for a day or two, you know, because he just doesn't have time to meet you on the schedule in New York. And I'm like, "Okay." <laughs> Uh, so I get out to LA, set me up at the Nico Hotel there on La Cienega, a nice hotel, mm-hmm. and I rent a car, the whole deal. And uh, and then I'm supposed to meet with the next day to pitch, get a call. Hey, Ethan, sorry, uh, he can't meet with you. Can you stay on for an extra day? Oh. And I'm like, sure, you know. Meanwhile, I, I, I'm going to run around town trying to get other, another job, <laughs> you know, meet have me with producers, you know, development people. I just like on their dime. Okay, this goes on for day after day. Like every day, they call. Ah, we're sorry. Is can you stick around? For I mean, okay, sure. I'm not no problem. I, yeah, no, okay, it's all right. You know, <laughs> I'm taking full advantage of it. And then they say, call again. Hey, I'm sorry to do this, but he has to fly back to New York on the because there's issues with the Stallone movie. Can you stay the weekend? And so I'm there like a week, <laughs> Just, you know, ordering room service, you know, yeah. <laughs> going out with my friends. Hey, I got per diem. I'm buying dinner. And finally, they're like, okay, he can meet with you tomorrow. Uh, go to the Peninsula Hotel. And so I'm there with the executive um, and, um, and, and like four or five of the executives there, you know, all the vice presidents. And, uh, I'm sitting in the lobby 
and I look across and I realize I'm, I'm staring at Sir George Martin, the producer of the Beatles, who's right. sitting there waiting for his meeting. Oh. And I'm like, oh, so want to go up and talk to him. <laughs> <laughs> you know? But no, I, I know the minute I get up to go over to say, excuse me, Sir George, I'm a big fan, um, that they're going to call me, for, you know. And sure enough, Sully, like, okay, he's ready for you. So I get into the elevator with these six executives. We go up to his giant suite on the top floor, this vast room. And uh, and he comes to the door, and, and he's wearing a dress shirt. And I can say all this now, now that, you know, their empire has collapsed. But I've never <laughs> told this story before um, uh, through all their their horrible things they've done. Um, but... Like his his dress shirt is all all like got wet patches like sticking to his skin all over. I'm like, oh, is that sweat, or did he just get out of the shower? Like he's working so fast he didn't have time to dry himself. I don't know what's. I shake his clammy hand, and uh, and so they sit down at this giant table and they put me on one side and like the, the executives and him are on the other side of the table. Him in the middle, like three guys on each side of him, yeah. and. Uh, and he goes, I got to be on a plane in ten minutes. Shoot. And I'm, you know, I'm expecting the kind of, you know, the forty-five minute chat and you know, a little mm-hmm. this and that. And I'm like, oh, uh, okay. So uh, the story, you know, and I start going into it. And he's like, oh, okay, I like that. That's good. That's good. I don't like that. That's stupid. Don't do that. You know? And mm-hmm. I'm like, okay, uh, we won't do that. You know? And then one of his executives says, uh, so you're saying the guy's a ghost? What? No, I didn't say anything about him being a ghost. Hey. Ethan, that's a great idea. You should be a ghost. Don't get defensive. I'm like, I'm not. I'm not getting defensive. No, it's like such a great passive aggressive move, you know, to say, don't get defensive when you're not being defensive. And then you have no way to respond that won't sound defensive. Yeah. <laughs> and so he just denigrating me, hating everything I'm saying. This is like the worst interview I've ever had. And, uh, and, and uh, so toward the end of it, this is what what you asked that we, this is how the story comes full circle yeah. he says well ethan what have you been doing for the last nine years since he directed douse two i said well uh, i've had a lot of different things in development and he goes boy that's sure a hell of a lot of development like meaning you can't get a movie made you know you're just you're so pathetic really been developing scripts for nine years <laughs> i said oh god so I get out of the meeting, and my agent has said, you know, call me the second you're out so I know how it goes. So I call her up as I'm, like, driving away from the hotel. I said, that was just the worst. It was a disaster. There's no way I got the job, you know. Yeah. And she's like, oh, I'm sorry. And I said, he did not like me. He did not like the ideas. Kind of, I mean, he liked some of it, but, uh, you know, and, I mean, he basically, you know, said I was a putz, that, you know. And so there's no chance I'm writing or directing this movie. Yeah, I'm so sorry. And uh, she's let me call over to, to Jeff uh, Kurz, the who was the executive, and really was my champion there at the at the company, you know, and, and really supportive of me and the script and everything. Yeah. And she's let me call over and find out, you know, just how it went, and maybe, you know. So, uh, yeah, whatever. She calls me back 10 minutes later and says, he loved you. You got the job. Wow. <laughs> just like that, huh? I think, I was like, what? <laughs> he thought you were fantastic. Yeah, great. He, you got the job. Okay. So I go back to New York, write the script, and it's getting towards the holidays. So I, I send it in. And usually when you send in a script, you always get a call right right away from the executives. And they say, hey, I haven't had a chance to read it. I just read up to page five. Love it so far. It's, it's great. We'll get back to you. You know, you just say something, you know, just to make sure you're – Got the script, we're reading it. We may not hear from us for a couple weeks because we're so much busy with all the more important movies than yours here, but you know, we're on it, you know. I, silence. I don't hear a word, you know. Yeah. A week goes by, two weeks goes by, three weeks goes by. Now we're getting to the holidays and I have not heard one word from anybody. Mm-hmm. And so that usually means you're fired. Yeah. So I uh, they're interviewing other you know and they don't tell you right away because they're interviewing other writers to see what else is out there and so they might come back to you if they really can't get someone they think is better to replace you um, and uh, I've been on both ends of that <laughs> uh, being the rewriter and the rewritten and um, 
And so I was like, uh, you know, I mean, I'm definitely not making this movie. I mean, three months has gone by and I haven't heard from them. I mean, that means no, you're, you're done. So it gets into the new year and I'm thinking, well, you know, I was kind of planning and hoping that I'd be directing this movie in the new upcoming year. Um, so I called my agent and I said, look, I know that they haven't returned the call. They, they, they I'm pretty confident I'm dead and fired. Yeah. Um, can you just call over there just to confirm it? I'd like to just clear this off my slate so I don't have to think about it or worry about it and just get on to other things. And she says, yeah, I'll, I'll find out what's going on. And I suddenly get a call from the executive and he says, Ethan, hey. I said, he says, so no one, no one's talked to you or something like that? You haven't heard from anybody? I said, no, I never heard a word. I said, I sent the script, what, three months ago? And he says, no, you've got a green light. You need to be out here in two weeks. <laughs> I was like, "What? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're we're gonna start pre-production. I'm sending you a list of uh, you know possible producers. See who you, you want to work with." <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> I, have a, I have a green lit movie, and I'm the last guy to know about it. Yeah, I was thinking, what if I never showed up? <laughs> yeah. So Miramax was a little bit of a um, yeah. It a was handful. it was always. <laughs> a lot going on going on over there. Yeah, I've I've met people who have, I've met people who have left the business because of stories like that. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. So and the, then you know went and made the movie. It had a great time. It had a great time making that film. And uh, good people and and uh, it was a fun shoot. So your your new so, mo- the new movie that you mentioned before, Journey to the Forbidden Valley. Uh, does that have a release date? Uh, it's been out. Um, it, it didn't get a theatrical release in America. It did in China. Okay. Um, it was a co um, and so um, we uh, it was it was a troubled production in terms of the financing, all the typical classic stories of you know the Chinese producers, you know, not p- paying what they said they would, whatever you know, just typical stuff. Um, and so, um, but I hold the rights outside of China. And uh, and so it's on Amazon Prime. It's on Hulu. It's on you know your your yeah. favorite local uh, digital uh, platform, and uh, and now it's just kind of starting to get its international release. Um, and yeah, so the post production was was tough. I yeah. had to do it on on a shoestring, but uh, it turned out pretty good. You know, it's a, it's not a bad little film. That's, and that's uh, good. I'll check it and out. Especially under. Under the extraordinarily difficult circumstances that I came away with a completed movie, there's a lot of people going to China and come back without a film, you know. Yeah. Um, and uh, I remember at one point I was invited to a, a conference in Beijing to discuss the, the U.S. co-production, uh, China co-productions. And again, we were a super low-budget movie, very under the radar screen. Mm-hmm. And, but there are all these, this is when there was a kind of a China gold rush, so to speak, with a lot of people trying to figure out how to make movies in China. Um, and, and so I was at a conference with, uh, former heads of studios, right. um, producers of some of the biggest movies ever made and, and little old me, uh, invited there because I was, you know, I actually made a movie in China. <laughs> so the, the speaker who got up, he, he, he said, uh, and, and it was funny because he was kind of making a point. I don't think about me individually, but you know all these big wigs all these big time american uh producers and presidents and things mm-hmm. and he said can i see a show of hands how many people in this room have actually made a film in china and i was the <laughs> only one to raise my hand and so you've got some of the top producers and and presidents of studios in the world looking over in the corner going who's that yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, who's He's made a movie. We, we've been talking about it for years, you know, <laughs> and, yeah. and uh, doing a lot of development. And there's only one guy in the room who made a movie, and, and that was me. Oh, that's, um, that's good. So, um, yeah, but one one was enough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, making movies in China. Ethan, thank you so much for coming on today. This has been a lot of fun. Well, thanks for having me, and good luck with your uh, series. And who who are you do, who are you interviewing next? Uh, Geretta Geretta from Demons, Italian horror movie. Oh, nice.
Yeah, she's my, uh, she's uh, coming on for the second time, and I gotta get to her. <laughs> Very good. All right. Well, thanks, and um, good luck with everything. My pleasure, sir. You have a great day, and I'll check out that movie. All right, thanks. Okay, bye. bye. Well, there you have it. Ethan Wiley. Ain't he a cool dude, huh? Nice guy. I'm so glad I got to talk to him today. And I'll check out that movie. Sorry about the technical uh, issue we had at the end there. I will cut it in post. Well, until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, there's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Liar, dudes! <laughs>